This week on Georgia Traveler, we look back on the Civil War in Georgia. Over the past seven seasons, we have shared stories of the state's most amazing, yet often haunting, destinations. Join special host Bruce Burkhardt and the Georgia Traveler team as we remember Georgia's Civil War. One of the most traumatic events in our nation's history, the Civil War, was fought almost entirely in the South. Some of the most critical battles of that conflict took place here in Georgia. So, for now, Georgia Traveler becomes Georgia Time Traveler, stepping back 150 years. Join us as the Georgia Traveler team journeys to destinations across the state where this epic confrontation played out, and where visitors today can get a real sense of what this conflict was like and almost smell the gunpowder. Though the name of William Tecumseh Sherman is indelibly linked to the Civil War in Georgia, the war first came to our state on the coast several years before Sherman ever got here. April 10th, 1862, the siege of Fort Pulaski near Savannah. Union batteries on Tybee Island using a new, more accurate weapon called rifled cannons unleashed a barrage of fire across the Savannah River. Fort Pulaski, with its seven and a half feet thick brick walls, was considered indestructible. Pretty much what you have is on April 10th in the morning, wee hours of the morning, Fort Pulaski is surrounded. Uh, just on the other side of those trees, you have the south channel of the Savannah River and Tybee Island, and you have 11 cannon batteries with 36 guns and mortars that have been set up. Confederate commanders were not worried about cannons more than 1,600 yards away. The general idea is cannon can't really be effective beyond now 600 yards, maybe even 1,000 yards. The closest point of Tybee, that's Goat Point. That's 1,650 yards away. That should be too far. It was a fatal assumption. After only 30 hours, the guns had opened gaping holes in the fort's walls. And the reason for that is, is this cannon right here. Uh, this is a 30-pounder, a Parrot rifle. 30 pounds because it fires a 30-pound projectile that comes out of the, the muzzle, but because of those rifle grooves inside, it's coming out spinning. And that gave it great speed, great distance, most importantly, great accuracy. And it was able to smash and uh, shatter the brick walls of Fort Pulaski. The great impregnable Fort Pulaski fell into Union hands, and the world took note. The age of the masonry fort had come to an end. Today, Fort Pulaski is a much more welcoming national park, greeting more than 400,000 visitors a year. You can join a guided tour or pick up a map at the visitor center to explore on your own. About the same time that Fort Pulaski surrendered, the town of Adairsville won its place in Civil War lore with an incident that had no major strategic significance, but made a heck of a good story. The Great Locomotive Chase is probably the greatest yarn of the Civil War. It's just one of the great stories. I and mean, you got heroes on all sides in this thing. It's fascinating. Adairsville, the first Georgia town to be listed in its entirety on the National Register of Historic Places. And as soon as you drive into town, you see why. As it does today, this 1847 depot stood right next to the train tracks at the time of the Great Locomotive Chase, also known as Andrews Raid. Union spies snuck into Big Shanty, Georgia, now known as Kennesaw, to steal the Confederate locomotive, the General. They succeeded initially, and Andrews Raiders raced the engine north toward Chattanooga, destroying train tracks, telegraph lines, and bridges along the way. And the pursuit, of course, starts right away with Conductor Fuller and an engineer by the name of Murphy. You start out on foot, and then they commandeer a pole car, and they get two more locomotives, and they finally end up in the locomotive Texas. Southern forces raced the Texas backwards at full speed after the Yankees until finally running them down north of Ringgold. Eight of the 20 Union Raiders, including James Andrews, were hanged on June 7, 1862. The other thing that's noteworthy about the Great Locomotive Chase is it was the occasion for the awarding of the first Medals of Honor. Uh, two Union soldiers. The two famous locomotives are still intact and on public display in Georgia. The Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History is the resting place of the General. Here you can learn all about the events of the chase and have a little fun with the model train reenactment. <laughs> 
And about 30 miles south of Kennesaw in Grant Park, you will find the Atlanta Cyclorama and Civil War Museum. Step inside the front entry and the Texas awaits your arrival, apparently ready to continue its pursuit forwards or backwards if necessary. A few months after the Great Train Chase in July of 1862, another southern bastion, Fort McAllister, fared a little better than Fort Pulaski. It repelled the first of seven Union attacks. It stands today as one of the best preserved earthwork fortifications of the Confederacy. Nestled among giant live oaks about 15 miles south of Savannah, Fort McAllister is named for Captain Joseph McAllister, who owned the plantation here. Important because of its strategic proximity to the Ogeechee River and Savannah, Fort McAllister beat back all who attacked before finally falling in 1864, effectively ending Sherman's march to the sea. More about that later in our show. But the first major battle here, March 3rd, 1863. Union Rear Admiral Samuel F. DuPont ordered three ironclads to use Fort McAllister basically as target practice. At the time, the fort seemed an easy target. It was only a small three-gun earthwork battery, but Union forces were in for a surprise. Fort McAllister on the Ogeechee River and is essentially guarding the passage to the interior, all right, behind Savannah. And so it is attacked repeatedly uh, by Union ironclads, among other things. But it's an earthen fort, and so that earth absorbs the rifled artillery from the Union ironclad ships. For eight hours, they bombarded the fort, but McAllister did not fall, a Confederate victory thanks to that earthen construction. Holding off Union forces at Fort McAllister was a major test for the Confederacy. Chickamauga would be another even bigger challenge. Chickamauga, for a word that rolls so easily off the tongue, its meaning is actually quite harrowing. Supposedly the word Chickamauga means river of death, but that is at best a very loose translation uh, based on what's possibly mythical, possibly true. Cherokees who were afflicted with uh, smallpox uh, went to the river to bathe to relieve their high fever and died there. So theoretically it means River of Death, but of course being linked to the Battle of Chickamauga that's taken on uh, a more uh, definitive meaning of River of Death than it ever had to start with. The site of the most deadly Civil War battle, second overall only to Gettysburg, is right here in Northwest Georgia. Over 5,000 acres playing host to a million visitors annually. And some of those visitors take advantage of the bicycle tours, this one led by park ranger Chris Young. He paints a picture of what happened here on September 19th and 20th, 1863. 66,000 Confederate soldiers fight back 58,000 Union troops advancing from Chattanooga. But on September 20th, Union commanders make a fatal mistake. They try to close up and support a gap in the federal line that doesn't exist. If I only have two brigades, my other one is in Chattanooga that's protecting the city, how can I close up and support at the exact same time? He moves his men out of line, moving north, and he opens up a 700 yard wide gap. Seven football fields wide. This fatal mistake tipped the scales. The Union Army of Cumberland succumbed to the Confederate Army of Tennessee. Despite staggering losses on both sides, this would become the last major Confederate victory of the Civil War. Whether you're traveling by foot, horse hooves, or tires, uncover the nation's first and largest federally preserved Civil War battlefield, which opened in 1895 to a crowd of veterans and politicians. The thing to really know about the, the battlefield of Chickamauga is it was the first battlefield that was set aside by the federal government and it was set aside uh, very much under the pressure of the veterans groups who wanted to have a place to commemorate their fallen comrades. Read and immerse yourself in the history memorialized by the park's 705 markers, monuments, and tablets, a place of mixed solemnity and irony. Take, for instance, this marker, where President Lincoln's brother-in-law, Benjamin Helm, was killed in combat defending the South. Benjamin Helm was uh, shot fatally through the chest 
and died on September 21st. But here's the thing, he was married to Mary Todd Lincoln's half-sister. So he was Abraham Lincoln's brother-in-law and it is said that uh, both Mary Todd and Abraham Lincoln wept for his death, uh, even though of course he was an enemy soldier. So much to see, so important to be seen. With the combat scene so alive around you, it's hard to go home empty-handed. Luckily, the Visitor's Center has you covered. Drop by the bookstore and purchase a memento or gaze upon this sizable Civil War gun collection. The rifles may not be for sale, but the experience of Chickamauga Battlefield hits the bullseye in preserving Georgia's Civil War legacy. The value of having preserved Civil War battlefields is that you can see the ground on which the history was made. You see where the heroes made their sacrifices, and there's no substitute for seeing the ground, for feeling the place. You get an emotional connection uh, with a battlefield. This is where it actually happened. Though federal forces were turned back at Chickamauga, seven months later, there was a new sheriff in town. General William Tecumseh Sherman took over command of the Union Army in Chattanooga. And in early May of 1864, Sherman began what became known as the Atlanta Campaign. Atlanta became Sherman's target because Atlanta was really the heart and soul of the Confederate military industrial complex. I mean, it's the great railroad hub of the Southeast. Uh, it's the great manufacturing center. Uh, everything, all supplies that travel east or west through the Confederacy have to come through Atlanta. Uh, if you break Atlanta, you have broken the back of the Confederacy. One of the first confrontations of that campaign was the Battle of Resaca. What remains today is a haunting and poignant reminder of that bloody battle. The Resaca Confederate Cemetery is a quiet, shaded acre of land off Interstate 75. It would be hard to stumble across without looking for it. It's one of the most beautiful Civil War sites in Georgia, but even more captivating than its beauty is its story. In May 1864, Confederate soldiers fought with forces of Union General William T. Sherman, who were advancing toward Atlanta. About 2,800 Northern and Southern men died in the Battle of Resaca, when local resident Mary Green, who had fled the fighting, returned to her father's farm, she was devastated to see that many of her fallen Confederate brothers lay in hastily dug, shallow graves. Green sprang into action. Convincing her father to donate this corner of his property for a cemetery, she set about raising the money and manpower to give 440 Southern soldiers a proper burial, a headstone, and an eternal resting place. Today, more than 300 of those graves are still unmarked. Fighting his way through North Georgia against stiff opposition from an outnumbered Confederate army, Sherman finally came to his last major obstacle before reaching Atlanta. Kennesaw Mountain, today, looks down upon suburban Cobb County. But back in June of 1864, the view was different a view of more than 100,000 advancing federal troops under the command of General William Tecumseh Sherman. To advance to Atlanta, Sherman needed to get around the mountain. It's the fortress, if you would. Or as one author called it the Gibraltar of Georgia, which I think is uh, an exaggeration, but still, it is the key element of this line. It's what this line is anchoring on to. Uh, the southern defense line, eight miles long that went up and around the mountain, was made up of 60,000 soldiers, the Army of Tennessee, under the command of General Joe Johnston. On top of the mountain, Confederate artillery protected the rail line below. The mountain, uh, as now, dominates the rail line. The uh, rail line runs today where it did in 1864. You can hear the railroad down You can hear the railroad going by now. That's the old Western Atlantic Railroad, and it's the principal supply line for Joe Johnston's army coming north out of Atlanta it's also the principal supply line for Sherman's army coming south out of Chattanooga. So it's critical to both sides. This is one of the gun positions of Charles Lumsden's Alabama Battery, who was emplaced up here with the intention of interdicting the rail line down below. What the Federals do is to run a, an engine and a tender to the wooden water station down there. 
and when they stop to refuel, rewater, then Lumsden opens fire on them. He said, I hit the water tank, I scattered water and yanks about indiscriminately. What the Confederates didn't know was that the Federals had longer range cannons below, and once they had given away their position. And the Confederate officer who was describing it, he said the Federal fire was so accurate that they were exploding their shell about three feet above our works. He said they began to work us over scientifically. But this is not where the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain took place. It was actually two battles on ridges below on the morning of June 27th. After repeated and unsuccessful attempts to outflank Joe Johnston's Confederates, Sherman made a fateful mistake. He ordered a full frontal assault against a well-entrenched Southern line. After the failure of that flanking movement, Sherman then makes the decision, okay, they've extended their line, they have not gotten in significant reinforcements, therefore the line itself ought to be a shell. We ought to be able to break through. It was a costly miscalculation. In what's known as the Battle of Cheatham Hill, the Federals lost nearly 1,800 men in less than a half hour. So they had, I mean, how many, how many folks were charging up that hill? Probably, in essence, further than we see here, about 5,000. Wow. And they could just be mowed down here. And that's what happened. War and peace. On land where brutal fighting took place, sometimes hand to hand with bayonets, today, hikers and equestrians enjoy the quiet solitude. The battle at Cheatham Hill earned the nickname Dead Angle, and here's why. As you can see on this map, the Confederate defense line ran along this ridge and went out this way and formed an angle or a point. It was here that the battle was fought, and it was here that a lot of soldiers died, mostly Union soldiers. At the same time this battle was going on, there was another Federal frontal assault a few miles down the line, a place called Pigeon Hill. And like the rest of the Confederate line, they were defending a road, one of several Sherman needed to get to Atlanta. And this, this road, this busy road now, was actually a this road This was that, a wartime road, the Burnt Hickory Road. The Burnt Hickory Road. And it pretty much here runs where it did in 1864. Again, this attack failed, and the Federals took heavy losses. A Confederate victory, but... But in truth, it's kind of like being ahead at the end of the third quarter. It's nice but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, the losses that he takes in this is the most significant losses he takes, and he, he doesn't do a frontal assault again. And he learns this lesson. He's willing to, to, to say, all right, we tried that, it didn't work. We won't do that again. Sherman eventually does outflank Johnston's forces, and as we all know, makes it to Atlanta. The story of the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain is far more complex than can be covered here, but at the Visitor Center, the museum explains the whole Atlanta campaign in much greater detail, as well as the very human stories of the people, both blue and gray, who shed so much blood here. Now, it was on to Atlanta. As you drive along these streets, it's hard to envision thousands of soldiers fighting hand-to-hand -hand with bayonets in a struggle to take the city. The term Battle of Atlanta is really a misnomer. The term should actually be battles, plural, for Atlanta. And there's a series of battles uh, that take place within what is today the I-285 perimeter. July the 20th, the Battle of Peachtree Creek. July 22nd, the Battle of Bald Hill, which was subsequently called the Battle of Atlanta. And July 28th, the Battle of, of Ezra Church. On July 22nd, what is now known as the Battle of Atlanta took place in present-day East Atlanta. Considered a Confederate success, casualties were enormous on both sides, some 5,500 men for the South and 3,600 for the North. But Sherman lost one of his prize commanders in the battle, General James McPherson. A monument marking his death was established at the intersection of McPherson and Monument Avenues. A Union cannon, once used to protect the Union's front line, marks the spot. You can find even more historical markers and monuments beginning just south of the Carter Center to the intersection of Moreland Avenue and Interstate 20. Bald Hill, located off Moreland Avenue and Flat Shoals Road, was once target of Union forces, who later renamed it Leggett's Hill after their commander. <laughs> 
The Battle of Atlanta was the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. It also helped ensure President Abraham Lincoln's re-election. Lincoln was not at all sure, in fact, was relatively sure of the other case, that he was not going to be re-elected. So the North needs a, a big shot in the arm. Probably the fall of Atlanta, if it didn't guarantee Lincoln's re-election, made it much more certain. And Lincoln's re-election meant the North was going to prosecute the war to the end, and the South wasn't going to get to negotiate a peace. It was going to have to give up. By the end of August 1864, Sherman had cut the last remaining rail line at the Battle of Jonesboro, causing Confederates to flee Atlanta. With the capture and cutting of that railroad, uh, the jig is up for General Hood and the Confederates. They're forced to either evacuate the city and save the army or stay inside it and starve. By the end of 1864, General Sherman's troops had literally blazed a trail from Atlanta to Savannah, that infamous march to the sea destroying much that was in their path. Approaching Savannah, Sherman and his army were in desperate need of supplies. The plan, take over the lightly defended Fort McAllister so Union supply ships could reach them through the Ogeechee River. Though Fort McAllister had repelled seven Union assaults, this last battle would not end as well for the South. On December 13, 1864, Brigadier General William B. Hazen ordered the attack. General Sherman watched from an observation deck built nearby. Only about 230 Confederate soldiers were there to defend the fort, and those earthwork batteries and pointed stakes proved no match for the 4,000 Union men. As they got closer and closer, they were just becoming more and more densely packed. And by the time they got here, there's a, a really neat um, illustration in one of the newspapers. It must have been just a solid wall of blue soldiers. And these 200 men in here, you know, they knew it was all over. In 15 minutes, it was all over. And on the morning of the 21st, uh, some city officials were riding out, and the first federal officer they ran into, they surrendered the city. General Sherman sent President Lincoln a telegram presenting Savannah as a Christmas present. For the rest of the war, Fort McAllister served as a prison for Confederate captives. Only four months after the Confederates lost Fort McAllister, the Civil War was over. The fort then fell into ruin until the 1930s when automotive pioneer Henry Ford restored the site for the public. Today, visitors can do a self-guided tour and take in the museum, or just stroll around and get a feel for how this sturdy fort took so much punishment. But punishment took on a different, even darker meaning at a place about 200 miles west of here, Andersonville. About halfway between Macon and Albany, Georgia, lies Andersonville, the site of America's most notorious war prison. During the Civil War, the Confederacy held thousands of Union soldiers captive at what was then called Camp Sumter. Tall pine trees cut from the surrounding forest and buried into the ground created a 15-foot wall enclosing 26 and a half acres of open field. Prisoners were exposed to heat and sun in the summer, cold and rain in the winter with no means of escape. 50, 60, 100 prisoners milling about in this corner, their smell, their activity, the ever-present watchfulness of the guards on the towers, and the sense of drudgery and challenge that faced every, every man as a prisoner of war here during the Civil War. And it wasn't the numbers of prisoners alone that created Andersonville's horrific reputation, it was the conditions. This tiny creek was the only drinking water source for the prisoners here. It quickly became so unsanitary that diseases like dysentery and diphtheria quickly spread among the men. That's because what they called the sink was also their toilet. Prisoners died here at a rate of more than 30 a day. Today, visitors may walk through the historic site and imagine to a degree what it may have been like. Because of its notorious reputation as a POW camp, the Andersonville National Historic Site has since become a haunting yet fitting home for the National Prisoner of War Museum. Here in the National Prisoner of War Museum, we explore the experience of American prisoners of war beginning with the American Revolution all the way to present conflict. A rare item we have on display in the museum are original clothing worn by a prisoner here during the Civil War at Camp Sumter at the military prison. And this is underwear, but it's representative of the fact that prisoners were not being provided their clothing by the Confederacy. They were scavenging what was left of their own uniforms or taking it from dead prisoners before they were buried. During the Civil War, nearly 13,000 of the Andersonville prisoners did escape the drudgery of this place through death. 
They are buried here at the Andersonville National Military Cemetery, which continues to serve as a final resting place for American veterans. Whether you're touring the cemetery, the stockade, or the museum, the Andersonville National Historic Site tells the story of the struggle for life, no matter the circumstance. With the fall of Atlanta and later Savannah at the conclusion of Sherman's march to the sea, the war, for all intents and purposes, was over in Georgia, and for that matter, the rest of the country. Less than four months later, General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox. Well, we Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.